Our first speaker is uh, Chris Rogers, who's a postdoc at Columbia University under Randy Bruno. Um, in case he has more shame than me, I'm going to go out and say Chris is looking for a faculty job. So um, if you have search committees out there, yeah, tell them to tune in. Um, and I will post Chris's Twitter and a link to his paper in the chat. Uh, take it away, Chris. You're muted. All right, hopefully everybody can hear me now. Thanks for that introduction, Chloe. Um, let me try to turn on my, uh, oh, good, I'm sharing my computer sound. I do have sound for one of these, so hopefully that will work. So um, I'm interested in how, how we identify objects in the world around us, how we explore our world, and how we make sense of the objects that we encounter. And so this is something that um, you and I uh, might use our fingers to do, as in this image on the left, whereas mice and rats might use their uh, whiskers to do a very similar thing. And so to understand how that might work, I developed this shape discrimination task for head fixed mice. And so, and I used high speed video to understand how they perform this task. So what you're looking at now is two example frames from the high speed video. The mouse's head is actually out of frame uh, down here on the lower left. And uh, I've tracked the individual whiskers on the face. And these whiskers are the same in basically all mice and they have names. So I've labeled them here, C1, the long blue one, C2, the green one, and C3, the short red one in the front. And the mouse's job is to make sense of the whisker contacts that he's making on the shape um, and use that to determine whether the shape is concave, as you see on the left, or convex, as you see on the right. And so these are, the, these are the rules that the mouse has to learn. He needs to learn to lick right for convex shapes and to lick left for concave shapes. But I also trained a control group of mice to learn a different task. So this is called the shape detection task, as opposed to shape discrimination. During detection, the shapes are the same and the positions and the timing of everything is the same, but the rule is different. These mice have to learn to lick right uh, if either shape is presented, convex or concave, and to lick left on control trials where no shape is presented. So having these two tasks is going to allow me to identify whether, whether the behavioral and neural effects that I see are just due to the shapes or whether they have to do with the task that the mouse is trying to perform on those shapes. And so here's a video of the task. It's been slowed down seven times, so it actually goes by a lot faster than this. Um, and you can see that I'm tracking the whiskers here. Good tracking was a lot of work to get working, but it was um, quite important because as you can see, he's making very brief, very fine contacts with the tips of the whiskers on the shape. And we didn't wanna miss even a single one of those contacts as time goes by. So you can see that he's touching both of these shapes in relatively complex patterns. And something about this pattern of context, contacts must be informative about the decision that he's going to make. So I just wanna, uh, because this is an interactive talk, I wanted to pause here and, and see if anybody has any wild speculation or guesses about how you think the mice might be performing the task. Um, what do you think might be different about the whisker contacts between the concave and convex shapes that the mice might be using to make their decision? So if you have any speculation at all, it doesn't matter if it's a crazy idea or even a bad idea. I'm just interested to see um, what everybody thinks might be happening. So you can type it in the chat or I don't know if it's possible for you to unmute yourself, maybe not. Oh, there's one suggestion already, great. I'll give it another. 30 seconds or something. Oh, hi, Alan. Good to see you here. Yeah, a lot of votes for timing so far. Yeah, so if anybody else can think of something and they want to just, uh, oh, we have a, we have a, a a plant in the audience. My collaborator knows the answer already. He's just joking. 
Um, but thank you so much for these, uh, for, for, these, for these suggestions. And this is actually exactly what we thought um, the mice would be doing before we did the experiment. So the, 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 the discussion of timing or the ordering of the whiskers, um, these, these are exactly what we thought might matter and what might differ between the shapes. And I, I think it's really interesting that you guys picked up on that too. What we found actually is something completely different and we were really surprised by it and it took a long time to kind of wrap our heads around it um, to, un to understand what might be going on. I think one clue that you could um, see in the video is that the whiskers are actually really tightly synchronized. The, C the different whiskers tend to hit at pretty much exactly the same time. So there ended up not being actually that much information in fine timing or in the ordering, although we certainly thought that there would be. So those are great, great um, suggestions. So I'll just skip the sort of um, uh, uh, mathematical stuff we went through to come up with this um, idea. But basically we think that the way, or we know now, the way the mice are doing this task is actually by comparing the relative numbers of contacts made by each whisker. So it has more to do with the number of contacts than the timing. And so what I'm plotting here is the behavioral meaning of the contacts made by each whisker, C1, C2, and C3. And so for instance, on the left, during the detection task, the, all of the bars are positive. And what that means is that contacts made by each of these whiskers means the same thing to the mouse. It always means that there's something there. It doesn't matter which whisker it was, it means that there was something there. And that's what he's trying to do during the detection task, something versus nothing. And so that makes sense. But during discrimination, this is where we see the really interesting difference. And so now in this plot, positive means convex shapes and negative means that the animal thinks it's a concave shape. And so we can see now um, to our surprise that C1 and C3 contacts now have opposite behavioral meaning to the animal. C1 contacts means that it's convex and C3 contacts means that the animal will think that it's concave. And that's the case, even though all three whiskers can touch both of the shapes, there are some slight differences in the relative proportion of the number of contacts that are made. And that's what the animal is using to make his decision. So now I want to show you a video of some spiking data. This is data I collected in somatosensory cortex, S1. You'll see the behavior on the left and the spikes that I recorded on the right and audio from one example neuron. So the neuron that you can hopefully hear is emitting spikes in response to whisker contacts that are made. All right, like now. And one last example trial. And now I want to show you a different neuron. You're going to hear audio now from a neuron that cares about whisking. So we did a lot of analysis of these neural data and um, I'll skip again the approach, but basically we found that neurons respond to contacts and to the motion of the whiskers and many other things. But I just wanna focus on the most important aspect of the neural responses, which is this. So one example neuron is shown on the left, the spikes that it uh, emits in response to contacts made by C1, C2 and C3 whiskers. And you can see that this example neuron responds much more strongly to C1 contacts than to C2 or C3. It turns out this is completely typical of the neurons I recorded during shape discrimination. The bar plot on the right shows that the population as a whole is a very strong bias towards C1 contacts. Now, as a, again, as an interesting control experiment, we looked in the shape detection animals. And here we found that there was no overall population bias. All the, the neurons on average responded the same to each of the whiskers. And so this is what we actually would have expected from decades of research in the barrel cortex. And what was really surprising was this bias that we observed during the shape discrimination task specifically. And so I'll just sort of conclude by saying, you know, what might that mean? Why would there be that bias in the response of the neurons? Um, so this is the same plot you've just seen showing the, the population bias. And if you think back to the first part of the talk, we now have some idea what, what, um, what is the difference between the two different tasks. And that can explain this, um, this result. So this is the plot that I showed you, which is the behavioral meaning of the contacts. And in this analysis, we didn't know anything about spiking, 
Um, but this analysis told us to detect convex shapes, you should count up C1 contacts and even subtract away C3 contacts. And what we're seeing in the neural responses is compatible with that, an enhancement of C1 contacts and a relative suppression of C3 contacts. So that leads me to the proposal that S1 is formatting the responses of, that are coming in in a way that makes it easier for a downstream region to read out a behavioral variable of interest, such as shape identity. Now in the future, what I wanna do is look at how motion plays into all of this. So a lot of this is in head fixed animals. And what I wanna do in the future is actually to free the mouse, allow him to freely explore um, stimuli, measure everything about its behavior as it does so, and relate that be high dimensional behavioral input to uh, the distributed uh, responses of sensory and motor brain regions. Uh, but I wanna just finish up now by um, thanking the people who helped me along the way. Randy Bruno, my PI, Stefano and Ramon are collaborators in the Theory Center here at Columbia, and Christina and Esther who helped me, with, helped me a lot with behavioral training, uh, my funding sources and all of you for your attention. And if I think we still have a few minutes left. So if anybody would like to ask any questions about anything that wasn't clear or really anything that um, you're curious about at all, I would be happy to, to hear from you. Yeah, we have um, four more minutes for questions. So feel free to um, either enter them in the chat or the Q&A box. Um, so, I will abuse my position as MC here and just go ahead and ask my question. Um, so what, what's your sort of next steps with this, Chris? Where, where is this going to go? Yeah, so actually I'm very interested in exploring this motion, uh, exploratory motion signal more. Um, that's something that a lot of people are seeing these days. We're seeing exploratory motion signals in sensory cortex. It's been reported by many labs um, and nobody really knows what it's for. And my hypothesis or the theory that I, that I wanna test is that it's there for sensory motor interaction. So you need to know how you're moving your body in order to make sense of the uh, sensory information that you have that's coming in. And so the experiments that I have in mind have to do with freely exploring mice um, who are uh, moving around an arena and coordinating their motion of their head uh, with sensory input that's coming in. And in that kind of behavioral task where a mouse really needs to integrate head motion signals with sensory input, I think that could be a good way to um, understand a, a bit more mechanistically what role these motion signals might play in a sensory decision-making computation. And I don't know if you know this, or this is an obvious question, um, but is there something analogous to this um, in humans as well? Um, like, do we have, has anyone found evidence of this in the way we explore our world? I would say that behaviorally, there, there are a lot of strong parallels. I think we don't know nearly as much about the neural processing in humans um, for obvious reasons. Um, but for instance, uh, one thing that I think is very telling that kind of motivated some of my future experiments is, um, again, the role of head motion. I think it's been very understudied. But um, if we think about auditory processing, um, you know, when, 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 when kids, for instance, have ear infections and they have impaired hearing in one ear um, or people with cochlear implants, a behavioral compensatory strategy that's often used is to, um, to move the head a little bit, actually. So you can compensate for your lack of spatial input in the, in the um, damaged ear by acquiring spatial information in a different way, which is through head motion. And so at that same sort of conceptual level, I think humans do something quite similar um, of course, if we have a good model of this in mice, then that would allow us to look at that at a more mechanistic level and potentially to look at some disease models as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. Um, we are going to switch gears now and hear um, from Jan Aru, who...